Hey guys, welcome to another Elvistory video. Um, this time around, I will be talking about Elvis Presley's recording sessions at American Sound Studio in 1969, in January of 1969 to be precise. Um, so how this all came about, um, Elvis normally recorded um, his records either in California or in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, come 1969 in January, uh, Elvis was getting set to record a new album and he was going to record it in the studios in Nashville that he normally recorded at. And so one night at uh, his house, uh, Marty Lacker was there with him and uh, Felton, Jar Felton Jarvis. Uh, Felton Jarvis was a producer for RCA Records. And now him and Elvis were setting up when Elvis was going to start recording at Nashville. And so Marty's in on this, listening to the whole thing. And at this point, well, most of you guys know Marty Lacker worked for Elvis for many years. But at this point in 1969, Marty wasn't working for Elvis. But he stayed close friends with him. And when Elvis was in Memphis, when he was home from touring or whatever, Marty would be at the house, they'd hang out. So, getting back to the point... Um, Marty is listening to Felton and Elvis talk about the Nashville recordings. And so he's listening to all this and Felton Jarvis has his back turned to Marty. But Elvis can see Marty's face. And so the whole time Felton's talking to uh, Elvis, Marty's kind of sitting back and he's looking at Elvis and he's going so Elvis uh, kind of looks at him and he's like what's your problem <laughs> like what's the matter and uh, he said you know nah nothing this just this this doesn't sound right for me he's like he's like you need to do something different this Nashville stuff just I don't think it's right for you anymore and so um, and you'll see he's like why don't you come record at American Sound Studio with this producer called Chips Moment and now why Marty brought this up was number one being that he knew in 1969 that these recordings that Elvis were going to do were going to be the first uh, actual good records he was putting out since he made full albums over 10 years prior to that. Because before that it was just, you know, movie songs and stuff like that. So this was more or less going to be uh, Elvis coming back into the music scene. And Marty knew how important that was to Elvis. And that he should do something out of the ordinary that he normally did. And so, uh, you know, he tells Elvis this. He's like, just come record with Chip's moment. So Elvis is like, ah, maybe, you know, maybe down the road I will, you know. So Elvis gets up, Felton gets up, and they go inside, and Elvis nudges Marty's like come on let's go eat dinner so Marty's like nah I'm not hungry so he's like now Elvis knew I was mad because I would never turn down a meal be it whatever it was so he knew I was upset so um, Elvis, Elvis and Felton Jarvis uh, go inside and Felton comes back in the room he's he starts talking to Marty, he's like, and Marty's like, you know, he's like, nothing against you, no offense, 
I respect what you do, but I don't believe Nashville is the right thing for Elvis at this point in his career. He needs to come back and he needs to come back on top. And he needs to do something different, you know, that will make him stand out. You know, kind of like a, a rebirth, really. So, you know, Felton, Felton was like, well, before you go any further, let me tell you this. Elvis just told me we're going to do the recordings at uh, American Sound Studio, like you suggested with, with uh, Chip's moment. So Marty is like, he's elated. So he like, he gets up and he goes in the kitchen he's like, Elvis, is this true? So Elvis is like, yeah, call, call up your guy Chips, set everything up, you know, handle the arrangements and everything. And we'll, uh, we'll get going on it. So right away, Marty's like, yeah, great. So he calls Chips and, um, after that, you know, Elvis is like, well, um, after we're done eating, I want you to come upstairs with me because I got a bunch of songs that I'm going to start that I want to record. And they were from, uh, Mac Davis. It was a few songs that, um. I'm not too sure of the names in them, but I think it was In the Ghetto, maybe one of them. And uh, so Marty's like, yeah, great, great. So, so now how this all came to be, why Marty suggested uh, Chip's Moment at American Sound Studio was uh, when he left Elvis in late 68, um, he got an offer from this company called Pepper Tanner and they were they were like a jingle company more or less but they were starting a they're starting their own record company called Pepper Records and they wanted Marty to um help start the record company and he did <clears throat> and he actually uh he recorded quite a few artists and he discovered uh, a female artist some of you might remember her called Rita Coolidge and he did his a lot of his recordings that he did for the artists that he recorded for Pepper Records he did it at American Sound Studio and he really liked what was going on there and he thought this would be great for Elvis and the reason being is the difference between Nashville recording studio an American Sound Studio was that they were, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> they were being innovative. And what I mean by that was normally, like, Elvis would sit in a booth and record his vocals while the band sat out um, in the open room and they played. It was like a separate thing. But from what Marty said was what they were doing at that time at American Sound Studio, they were doing it different. They, they would, instead of, you know, Elvis recording his vocals and then them uh, dubbing it onto the instrumental at American Sound Studio, Elvis would sit out in the open with all the other musicians and they would record at the same time live. And he said it was, at that time, it was such an innovative thing and he thought that would be great for Elvis because Elvis was all about, you know, performing with the band, you know. And he thought it would just be such a, an innovative, different sound for him. And, you know, Marty wanted to see Elvis uh, as a friend, you know, because Elvis, uh, Marty had no financial interest in what Elvis was doing at the time. He was concerned about him getting back on top as a friend. And so that's why he encouraged Elvis to do this because he knew what was going on at American Sound Studios and, and, you know, he knew it would be great for him. And so, um, so they set everything up and, uh, Elvis goes and records and he lays down, um, some tracks that he had gotten through, uh, RCA's publishing company, Hill and & Range. And now normally this was um, what Elvis would do. It was like the formula they had like with him and Parker and Hill and & Range. 
uh, Hill and Range would um, give songs to Elvis that Parker, you know, knew he would get a chunk out of. And um, then they would pass them along to Elvis. But what they wouldn't tell Elvis was they would see songs in there, but because they didn't get a chunk out of it, they would just kind of brush it aside and only only send songs to Elvis that they could make money off of. And that was like a big dis, dis, big disservice to Elvis because it was hurting him career-wise. And so, uh, now, Marty uh, knew this. And so one night, um, like I said, they recorded a few tracks, I think, for like uh, three or four nights. And then Elvis had uh, developed laryngitis and he got a little sick, so he had to take a few days off from recording. But when they got back to, uh, when they got back to Graceland, um, one night, this was the night before they were to go back and start recording again because Elvis was feeling better. Um, so according to Marty, one night they were all at Graceland and they were sitting in Elvis's office. And uh, I think it was Marty, Red West, Charlie Hodge, and uh, Lamar Fike, and Elvis. And they were trying to pick out songs that they were going to bring the next day to American Sound Studios for Elvis to finish up recording so they were going through all the stuff that hill and range was sending over and elvis was just so dejected he was going through these songs he's like man what is this stuff this ain't this isn't for me i can't record this and marty was like biting his tongue he's like mm. and he's like you know what i i took it this far with elvis i got him this far to do um the recording at American Sound Studios. So I figured, what have I got to lose by opening my mouth? So he's like, Elvis, you got to understand this. He's like, we were trying to get you, me, uh, Lamar, Red, whoever. We're trying to get songs for you. But the problem is, Hill and Range and Tom Parker will get their hands on it and they'll say no. No, because we can't make money off it. We can't get a copyright. That was the thing. They would get a chunk of the copyright from the song and make money off of it. Hill and Range and Tom Parker. So, you know, he Marty told Elvis this and um, he said, Elvis, what you need to do is you need to take control. You need to start picking out your own music. Whether you get, whether Hill and Range and Parker get a copy, copyright from it or not. It's like, you know, this, these records are going to be huge for you. You have to pick out songs you're going to like. You know what I mean? Whether people are going to make money off it or not and so he said Elvis just kind of sat there and he was like clenching his teeth and he was upset it's like I don't know if he was going to snap at me and but he said he swung around his desk chair and he slapped his hand down and he said for now on any song that I record I'm going to record it because I love it so at that point, Elvis kind of took, you know, he took the reins on that. And not only that, it started, he started to have that attitude um, around when he did the 68 special creatively. And I touched on that in my last video. But um, when it came time to do the albums, I think he, you know, they went back on that old formula. Elvis was just, like I said, he was used to, it was like a thing that they had, Hill and Range, Parker and Elvis. They would just pass along songs to Elvis 
that were going to make money for Elvis and Parker and everybody else and Hill and Range, you know, but they weren't necessarily songs that Elvis loved in his heart. You know what I mean? So this was a whole different approach. And Elvis made that decision. He's like, because he had no other, at that time he had in front of him songs he just didn't care to record and he didn't want to do it. And that's why Marty suggested it to him. So from that point on, Elvis was just like, the heck with it. Let's just find songs. He's like, whatever you got to do, go out. He's like, go find songs. And I think George Klein was in the uh, office too. He said to each and every one of them, he's like, everybody here in this office right now, find me songs. He's like, I don't care if, if Hill and Range are going to get copyright or if Tom Parker is going to get copyright. He's like, I don't care. He's like, I want to record it because I want to and I love the songs. So with that, everybody was like, yeah, yeah, all righty, no problem. So, and also the thing was, you know, a lot of artists in those days didn't, uh, I mean, like the old formula, when Elvis was selling millions out of the gate in the 50s, artists didn't mind if uh, Elvis used his songs and took a chunk of the copyright. They didn't mind because that song was getting blown up because it was Elvis. You know what I mean? But it was like 10 or so years later, it was a whole different situation. And Elvis wasn't as relevant as he was at that time in the music scene. And people's attitudes changed towards their own copyrights. And Marty explained this to Elvis. So, you know, like I said, with all of that in mind, that's when Elvis decided to take the reins on his uh, recording. His recording of all well, his songs. So... With all that in mind, they go back to American Sound Studio the next day. And Elvis says to Chips Moman, who was the uh, the producer at, at uh, American Sound Studio. He said, Chips, you know, we got no songs. I got nothing. He's like, I went over everything in my, uh, in my office last night and I got nothing. He's like... You know, so Chips is like, all right, you know, I got some songs here. One of them, one of them's called Suspicious Minds. And so he had Elvis listen to it and Elvis loved it. And of course, he said, let's lay it down. And they did. So while all this is going on, um, two people tried interfering, not with Elvis recording, uh, Tom Parker sent his assistant to Memphis from California, Tom Diskin, and also Freddie Beinstock, who was, uh, he worked for Hill and Range Publishing. Those two guys show up and they start getting into it with uh, Chip's moment about the songs that Elvis was picking because of the copyrights. They start not harassing him, but they were like, uh, can we speak with you, you know, out in the hallway? And so Marty Lacker was there. And Marty, he's like, I'm, I'm gonna have Chips' back through this, you know what I mean? I'm gonna make sure this gets done. And uh, they start getting into it with Chips. And he's like, we want a copyright from these songs and chips is like there's no way these are my songs you guys are not getting a copyright from them he's like you know don't take something of mine i wouldn't take something from you that was yours and you know marty's like this went on and on and it got you know it was getting very heated you know and basically Chips Moman told these got told Tom Diskin and Freddie Beinstock, you know, just take all your papers and all your stuff and get the out of my office. Cause uh you know, he he just wanted to know he wasn't gonna back down, he wasn't gonna be muscled into doing something he didn't want to. And so um 
Now, the vice president of RCA Records was also at the studio, uh, Mr. Harry Jenkins. And he goes into the hallway and he hears all this going down. And he walks up to uh, all the guys, you know. And Harry says, well, this is how it's going to get done. Felton and Chips, Felton Jarvis and, and Chips Moment are going to record Elvis. And those are the so whatever songs they pick out, that's what Elvis is recording. This is how we're doing this. So Tom Diskin got all upset. And uh, he goes back in and he now Elvis doesn't hear all this going on. He's inside recording Suspicious Minds. So Tom Diskin goes inside, back inside, goes up to Elvis and you know oh you know this is all wrong type of thing you know saying you know uh we're not getting a copyright from this song and this is how this sh this is shouldn't how it should be going you know so marty's standing there he's like i wanted to see what elvis was going to say to him he wanted to see if elvis was going to keep his promise about picking his own songs so Elvis looks at Tom Diskin. He said, well, Mr. Diskin, this is how it's going to go. Chips Moman and uh, Felton, Felton Jarvis and I are going to record these songs this way. So he got like super upset. He went to the phone. And after he got off the phone, he comes back in, grabs his stuff, goes back to his hotel and flies back to California to, to Parker's office. And what Marty later found out was that uh, Tom Parker turned around and said to Tom Diskin, um, well, if Elvis wants to fall on his, um, I'm going to say it nicely, if Elvis wants to fall on his butt, but Parker put it differently, if you know what I mean, then let him fall on his butt. So this this was what you know. Parker was upset. They all they saw was the dollar signs. These guys, you know, at that point, um, at that point in Elvis's career, him and Parker's uh, points of view were very different. I mean, back in the day, Parker. I mean, I'll give him credit. He was very instrumental in getting Elvis to where he needed to be as a superstar. And, you know, I applaud him for that, you know. But in the 60s, um, I don't believe Tom Parker. I think at a certain point, he should have been let go. Because all, the only interest Parker had that point at that point was lining his own pockets. You know, he didn't. Not that he didn't care about Elvis, but creatively, he didn't understand uh, how Elvis needed to get back on top musically. You know, all he saw was a formula, the formula of those copywritten songs that would make money, that Elvis would sing and everybody would buy. That's all Parker understood. He didn't get how Elvis needed to, as an artist, change creatively, you know. So it was my personal opinion at that point in time that they should have parted ways. But what are you going to do? But on any level, two albums came out of when they were done recording. Two albums came out of those American Sound Studio sessions. And those albums were from Elvis in Memphis, uh, which was released in June of 69 and Elvis back in Memphis which was released in October of 69 both albums went double platinum so so much for Elvis falling on as you know what this is what I mean by Tom Parker didn't know you know what I mean he didn't understand the whole how how Elvis needed to change and these albums were so great for Elvis in the fact that it brought him back to the original formula 
to where Elvis was singing songs that he loved in the beginning. That's what got him out of the gate in 55 and 56, you know, was him singing songs that he loved, you know. And now he was doing the same thing. So it was kind of, this, these two albums were uh, a rebirth for him. And going back to doing it the way he wanted to do it. By singing the stuff he loved. And so, like I said, um, both albums went double platinum. Uh, From Elvis in Memphis had 12 songs on it. And those songs were Wearing That Loved On Look, Only The Strong Survive, I've Hold You In My Heart, Long Black Limousine, It Keeps Right On A Hurtin', I'm Moving On, Power Of My Love, Gentle On My Mind, After Loving You, True Love Travels On A Gravel Road, Any Day Now, and In The Ghetto. And the second album from those sessions was, uh, like I said, Elvis back in Memphis, and that was released in October of 69 as part of a double album, actually. And that double album was called From Memphis to Vegas, From Vegas to Memphis. But then it was released on its own as a single album in uh, later in 1970. And the songs from Elvis back in Memphis were... Inherit the Wind, This is the Story, Stranger in My Own Hometown, A Little Bit of Green, And the Grass Won't Pay No Mind, Do You Know Who I Am, From a Jack to a King, The Fair's Moving On, You'll Think of Me, and Without Love. So, pretty much that is the story of... Um, the American Sound Studio Sessions. And like I said, I think this was like a rebirth at this point in Elvis's career. It was a major rebirth for him musically. And, you know, uh, the fact that he took the reins on this, I mean, he knew, I think he knew in his mind that, you know, that's what was going to do the trick. If he would have just kept on recording those same old ways. You know, not that Nashville was a bad place. He just needed to do something different. You know what I mean? He needed to have that raw energy again. And and he found it at American Sound Studios. And uh, so now the musicians Elvis worked at. Amer- American Sound Studio had uh, its own... I guess you could say house band that they that they used to record uh, with artists when they came in to record and it was a steady band that played with all the artists and they had a name actually and it was the 827 Thomas Street Band otherwise known as the Memphis Boys and in that band was Mike Leach Tommy Cogbill, Gene Chrisman, Reggie Young, Ed Collis, Bobby Emmons, Bobby Wood, and John Huey. And Elvis's backing vocalists for these albums were Mary Holiday, Mary Green, uh, Ginger Holiday, and Donna Thatcher. So, like I said, that's basically uh, the story of Elvis recording at American Sound Studio. And then I think at that point, he also, like later on, I don't know how many years later, he also went to record at Stack Studios in Memphis. And, you know, he, from that point on, he, you know, it seemed like he changed things up differently here and there. And uh, it it was a good thing that, you know, Marty Lacker really, to me, that was showing that Marty was a true friend to him. You know, he had a lot, Elvis had a lot of people around him that were, some say they were hanger-ons or this or that, but Marty really, you know, he cared about Elvis and he wanted to see, he wanted to see Elvis like he was in the 50s, you know, man, knocking him dead, 
you know, doing the songs he loved to do, being, you know, out there on the stage and in his element. And, you know, so I guess you could really, uh, for those two albums, for those sessions, you can thank Marty Lacker for that because he really pushed Elvis. He really pushed Elvis to do this because Elvis really didn't, you know, he, he wanted to stick with that, you know, with what works, you know what I mean? But it took Marty to nudge him a bit and, you know, and, uh, thankfully it all worked out and Elvis loved recording there. He loved, uh, you know, he loved how innovative they were and how different things was. And it, the thing of it was too, Elvis liked the challenge and American Sound Studio presented a challenge to Elvis in the way that it was, um, the way they did the recordings was what Elvis was not used to, you know what I mean? He was used to going in the little booth, like I said before, and this being done a certain way, but the way these guys did it, I mean, I think American Sound Studios did, uh, Recorded a couple of people like Neil Diamond, Dionne Warwick, and actually uh, one of Neil Diamond's songs um, was recorded on the Back in Memphis, the, the el album Elvis Back in Memphis, and that song was And the Grass Won't Pay No Mind. So they got uh, Neil Diamond's permission to do that song, and Elvis did it, and it turned out to be a great recording for him and those those two albums like I said you know for somebody that didn't record an, a, a studio album in, in over I don't know how many years before that you know for both albums to go double plat they didn't go double platinum just because they were sung by Elvis Presley you gotta remember at that point there was a lot of different things going on in the music scene people you know were, leaning on the Beatles and this and that and the other thing Elvis was not relevant at all in music in 69 I mean he really he really needed to make a statement and you know and sure enough you know he changed you know he changed his approach and everything and that launched him that was his rebirth those two albums so all right, guys, that's basically, that is the story for Elvis's time recording at American Sound Studio in Memphis. So, all right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed the story. And as always, TCB, oh, thank you for subscribing. And if you like the video, just give it a quick like. I really appreciate it. All right, guys. I hope everybody's doing well. And TCB and God bless.